Well, welcome listeners. Uh, my name is Rhonda Hull, and I am happy to uh, share with you today an amazing, courageous, wonderful woman who came into my life during the time that my dearest friend, Mary, was passing with cancer. Um, so let me introduce you to Joy Rodriguez, who believes that everyone deserves a good death. And the definition of good may change from individual to individual, but the right to define it remains constant. Because of her beliefs, Joy volunteers for End of Life uh, Washington as the Spokane volunteer, and she is the coordinator of volunteer client advisors. She has volunteered for traditional hospice and uh, is a working death doula. She has trained under the trailblazer Jerry Grace Lyons and is proud to be a part of a growing movement to take dying away from big business and bring it back to home. So I am really eager just to dive into um, just an organic conversation is, that kind of uh, helps me learn along with all of you how to accept and make friends with death as a part of life. So it's birth and death are the, you know, we, we take our first breath when we're born and we have our last exhale when we die. And life to me goes beyond the birth and the death. And, and so from that place, I just welcome you, Joy. I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you very much, Rhonda, for having me. Yeah. So if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to stepping into doing death doula work and, and working with End of Life Washington. I really feel that it's something that everyone should be able to have and not just like with birth, not something that needs to be controlled by others. It's, it's your right to die the way you want to die. And, and it's our privilege, those of us that can to help you obtain what you wish. And so for that reason, I've, I've gotten into this work. Um, I just fell into it. I have older parents. And so I ended up experiencing death a lot younger than a lot of people do with, with ones very close to me. And I saw it done right. And I saw it done not right. And, and I said, wow, this is something that an advocate can make a difference. Right. And so, and so that's what led me to it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have to say that how grateful I am to you in End of Life Washington, because you know that in my friend Mary's circumstance, she lived 15 minutes from the Washington border, the state line, which made it uh, we had to jump through all sorts of hoops to declare, to, to create a residence for her in Washington in order for her to have that choice available to her. And, you know, like you say, some deaths are good and some aren't so good. Some circumstances are handled well, others aren't. And it became a, a really challenging thing with only 15 minutes between one state that embraces that choice and another state that doesn't. And like you, I really am an advocate for choice. And so whether or not Mary chose to uh, end her life at her own hands by choice in that medical assisted ending of her life or whether she didn't, what I wanted for her was the freedom of having the choice. And, and I know how important that was to her. Um, so was it in being, were, were the passings of your parents the first 
deaths that you had been present at? And, and how have you viewed death in your lifetime? Um, well, grandparents, parents, siblings. Um, I've been fortunate enough that my husband is, is still with me. So thank you and my children. Thank you, God. Um, so, but, um, but basically everyone else has, has made their way um, from being living to being dead. And um, some of them, I felt like a lot of my training was done so that I could help my mother, who I was very, very close with. Uh -huh. with her transition and I thought that was wonderful that I was able to help her have what she wanted and um you know for her it wasn't about everyone has their own what what's what is the most important thing right what is the biggest priority and she says oh my grandchildren need to be able to go to school they need to be so we're going to move from California to Washington because my grandkids go to school in Washington and I don't want them to miss school. So <laughs> she got on a plane and she moved to Washington knowing that she had, you know, only a couple of weeks left. And she said, this is what I want. And so I said, okay, <laughs> are you sure? You know, and, and, um, and supported her in her choice. And she said, I don't want to feel pain. This, this is what I want. I don't want to feel pain. And so I said, okay, well then mom, we'll make sure you don't, you know? Um, and I think that some people say, I want to be surrounded by family. I want to feel the comfort of being in a hospital room, knowing that I have monitors going and everything's taken care of. I want, you know, whatever it is that this person says is the important thing to them. I think that's it's important that they get that right right yeah so so um did your mom do a medically assisted passing no she did palliative she uh -huh. did palliative sedation she did not feel that she needed to jump through those hoops because unfortunately for my mother she had a cancer diagnosis that was very rapid so she knew, found out her diagnosis five months, or I'm sorry, five weeks before she, she died. Wow. So, so she didn't, she didn't need to hasten her, her death because her death hastened all on its own. On its own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one thing to witness or be a part of your parents decline, but what led you to make the choice to work with as a volunteer of end of life Washington or to be a death doula? And did, can you explain for the listeners what a death doula is? And did you do formal training that led you there other than the passing of your mom? Oh yes. I'm sorry. My mother, um, died rather recently. So I, I was, I, I yes, I have been working in, in this, wow. uh, in this field for the past, depending on how you want to count it, um, seven years or so. And then my mother died last year. So yes, um, I began not knowing, knowing that it was something that needed to happen and knowing there was not, knowing that there wasn't that available to a lot of people. You say, oh my goodness, I'm dying. My loved one's dying okay, what do we do, right? Where do we go with that statement, right? Or I'm getting old. I'm, I'm, I know I can see it coming, right? Or I, I feel it in my, in my bones, in my chest, in my lungs. I feel it's coming, right? right. But what do I do? What do I do to, and so often we don't know or, there's nowhere to turn. Or if you do turn, you turn to the funeral parlor down the street who offers you a $20,000 package. Right. And is that really what you want? Or you, you go to your organized religion and maybe that's the right fit for you. But for many of us, it either isn't enough or it isn't the right fit. 
Yeah. And so there has to be another set of individuals who have done the research, who can answer the specific questions, who have walked the path and can say, okay, you can choose these options. Right. You can choose, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this other thing? And, um, and there are, and they're called death doulas. Uh-huh. And they know a little bit and are willing to share their knowledge. And then you as an individual can, can choose what you want that path to look like. Yeah. Everyone has to walk the path, but yeah, you can choose whether it's smooth or rough or we may not a pillar have, down. We may, <laughs> think that we don't have a lot in common, but the thing that we have in common is that we all are born and we all die. Mm-hmm. And I think birth has, because it's more often than not a joyous, welcoming experience, that it's more accepted you know we got dads into the delivery room and then we mm-hmm. you know home birth and uh, birth centers and that whole informed choice create your birth plan all of that is focused on birth and birth and death to me in in when i used to do labor coaching it's like some babies would come in and uh, that's an old soul and mm-hmm. other, you're like, wow, this is this one's first time around. It's like, regardless of what your spiritual religion beliefs or influences are, that that birth experience was impacted by so many different things. What the beliefs you came with, the the parents and grandparents around you, um, the doctors, and why not? We birth it. it it has been a commonly accepted thing in our experience or of life, but death is kind of still kept up behind the curtains. It is very much taboo still. Yeah. And so to me, it's always been uh, important to make it an easier conversation for people to have because we're all going to go through it we all are afraid of death but i think the more i talk to people it's not really the death that they're afraid of as much as they are being out of control and not knowing what's going to happen before death mm-hmm. and, and the act of dying yes and the act of dying is scary yeah yeah mm-hmm. um so it's very much a labor just it like is. how it's hard to come in. A lot of times it's really hard to leave. Yeah. yeah. You go through that, it, like in labor, it's transition. Well, there is a transition in death as well. Mm-hmm. And for so many who are there or walking that path prior to or actually present at the death, um, it helps them to be informed. It helps them to kind of have a compassionate way of learning from someone about what to expect. Yes. So that they feel better equipped to deal with their own emotions about it, but to be present for the person. Yes. Pass. And um, End of Life Washington also has the advanced directives which I think, as you know with your friend Mary, are wonderful ways of sorting out um, what it is you want. And it's free on the End of Life Washington website that you could download your own and fill it out at your own time and your own convenience. So it's not something that um, that organization is making a profit off of. Um, but and, and also, this is something that could be done in hospitals I think they also do it with the five wishes in a lot of different hospitals. Um, But to, to sort out on a piece of paper, what it is you want your death to look like. Yes. What, what is the important goals for you and what aren't. Right. Um, 
and and to think about things Very that possible. we just never even think to think about you know right um about how you would want things handled and yeah. um so i know it was especially with mary's diagnosis it it heightened my desire to review my informal advanced directive and become yeah. very specific. Mm -hmm. And like you say, it just, it depends on the individual. Some people like um, Mary w was very much wanting to donate her body to science and she had all of that outlined, but as a result of her cancer, she couldn't, but it, oh. it, mm -hmm. it was something that she could, think through and yes. it, it became the the outline when Mary wasn't able to express herself because of medication or having bad days and not being really with it mm -hmm. that we had that document to refer to and it made it it was a, an instrumental document for her partner Gary because he wanted her here yes but he could it's not about what he got through that instrument and through just an assortment of other learning opportunities he understood that it was his role as her medical power of attorney to implement what her wishes were not what his were yes um and it's also freeing for the partner that even though this isn't what they want they can acknowledge that it's not what they want yet still follow through with their partner's wishes with right. the with the patient's wishes because yes. yeah because without that piece of paper that you know handwritten jotted down piece of paper yeah. without that you say am i being judged as wanting to hasten my loved one's death by others right. no no I can't think of one person who wants their loved one not to be with them anymore right. it's not one right I can think of lots of people who want them not to suffer but yeah. not not one that would say oh I love you so much now you can go <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah exactly and let me help you right. <laughs> um, um, there, Bronnie Ware, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she, uh, I think she's done a TED Talk and she's written a book called uh, The Five Regrets of the Dying. Mm -hmm. And in her uh, experience with those who are passing, she really did research on the, the five regrets on your deathbed. You know, it certainly isn't that I wish I spent more time at the office, you know, right? <laughs> looking at in, in having been w with, uh, it's funny. I just, on my computer, I just got a, an email from Bronnie Ware's website. <laughs> <laughs> so, woo. Um, so with the, um, five regrets of the dying and with the people that you have been with, that you have helped across that bridge, what in your experience are the things that people are questioning or regretting in their final days? You know, people who choose the death with dignity law and then go through the process, which is cumbersome, which is a very cumbersome process uh, yes. and get to the end of the process and then pay the substantial amount of money that it costs to purchase the medication. Right. And then gather their people, make their plans, schedule their date, and then ingest. By the time they get to that point, they are resolute. Right. And they have gone through many of their stages of dying. And they are, generally speaking, past the point of regrets. Right, right. And I see that through that process, that it becomes 
a full circle time for those people around them because the questioning i mean it's not just a willy-nilly decision no it isn't it's it takes so much soul searching and courage for the individual that forces in a way or nudges forward the questioning of everyone around them so i know in mary's circumstance it was facing that she had been raised Catholic. Her family was still more actively practicing their Catholic faith, religion. Mm -hmm. Mary had taken a, a, a much broader, she had held her spirituality in a much broader term. And mm -hmm. so it, it was a process for her family, mm -hmm. that side of her family, to... Um, embrace her decision and yeah. it, it was uh it, it was touching to me to see that although they didn't necessarily at first especially understand or agree with it mm -hmm. as they saw the progression of her illness mm -hmm. and ev how committed she was to going through the steps that it took especially given we had to move her from from uh idaho to washington mm -hmm. and meet all of these that they stood in her shoes mm -hmm. and accepted her choice and i don't know if that eventually is true for all families but for me it was touching to see how they they loved her enough to support her choice even if it would not have been the choice they would want for her mm -hmm. Um, I think also, especially with Catholicism, it's important to remember that when taking advantage of the death with dignity law, that you, this is not assisted suicide. Right. Yeah. This is not suicide. The unfortunate fact is the people that are able to take advantage of this law do not have life in front of them. Right. They only have a downward progression towards death. And in fact, they need to have two doctors say with absolute confidence that they have six months or less to live right. to be able to qualify for this law. And so, they need to make that request to the one doctor twice with yes. 15 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So unfortunately, these people who are able to take, or fortunately, these people who are able to take advantage of this law are not committing suicide because they simply do not have a life left to live. Right. They are only hastening the death that is an absolute sure thing to occur. Right, right. Yeah. Um, how many states are there who support the death with dignity? Well, thankfully, here on the West Coast, we're doing pretty good. So we have Oregon was the first, Washington, California. I believe um, there's a few over on the East Coast, Virginia. Is it New Hampshire that just? I think New Hampshire and Massachusetts, maybe, maybe over on the east coast and then montana oddly enough is a county by county decision so since wow. they are such a freedom loving state they um have decided that this is a decision that could be made by each county right so right. so parts of montana and uh oregon washington and california and that uh, all of their laws are just slightly a little bit different so well and i know from the experience our experience with mary and the the difference between hospice in a state where in idaho where it was not legal and hospice in Washington, it was a world of difference. But even from what I understand, 
just because you would choose a hospice provider in a state where there's death with dignity, it doesn't always mean that they are, that they embrace that choice and that they're prepared to, to help support someone through. To, to me, we were so fortunate to find the, the hospice group that we did because Mary needed someone where she felt like she could explore all of the options. Like, tell me what death looks like. Tell me what death looks like with, with this type of cancer. Tell me how long you think I have. Tell me, you know, what if I stop eating and drinking? Um, what if I, uh, just die naturally, but do palliative, what, what is palliative? She had so many questions, but for the hospice people who didn't see the choice, that, that the choice scared them, that it was such a relief to have a hospice or like a death doula, you were so instrumental in just having someone who was not attached one way or another to her choice. They were just attached to supporting her choice and providing the education. Yes. Yes, I think it is a value. I'm glad to hear that Mary felt that we were helpful to her. Oh, um, yeah. And yes, I think you're right. It doesn't particularly matter what, um, whether you're, well, obviously, if you're not in a state that's, that has the law, you're not going to get very far. But, um, but if it, if you are in Washington, you still may not be presented with all of the choices because people come from their own personal background and their own belief system. And, and so sometimes that impacts the, the information they provide right. to their clients. And also the philosophy of the organization itself of that particular hospice also right. impacts the information that's given to the clients. And so here in Eastern Washington, we face a lot of challenges where the Catholic church um, does control the majority of our, of our hospitals yeah. and thus um, does make certain recommendations that seem almost as if they are the only choice when really they're a choice right a choice yes yeah and so to what what i found is that because death is not a comfortable conversation mm -hmm. even for doctors you know that doctors find it hard to provide information about death to their patients. Yes. That uh, it still seems like there, especially with the end of life, death with dignity option, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, a, it's, it was a challenging line to walk being an advocate and then just experiencing the grief journey with someone who's passing yes constantly be pulled into that I, that was another s just surprise to mary is once you're in that medical wheel that medical hamster wheel of tests and getting test results and they haven't called and you have to call and make sure that they're it's using up all of that energy that you would much rather be spending enjoying your final days yes so it was almost the relief that she was in hospice, but the disbelief because we are so conditioned that the Western medical model is somehow going to take care of it or hold it or f free us from, I don't know what. Mm -hmm. So what, that's what? Where having a strong advocate really comes into play because sometimes you need someone who is a few steps removed that says, hold on. This is what this path looks like. We right. can say, this is, if we continue with radiation, with chemotherapy, with trying the next drug, with trying the next drug, mm -hmm. we know what that path will look like. Right. 
if we decide to go in this other direction with homeopathic, with this and that, we know what that path is probably going to look like. And if, and where do you want to fit? Where do you want to be on that? So at, as a death doula, what training have you had? And, and how did you decide that being a volunteer, you don't get paid for your work with End of Life Washington, right? No, no not yeah. at all. No compensation, yeah. which is good, which is good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. and yet, how did they keep themselves afloat? And how did you decide that you wanted to, to be a volunteer for them? They, they try and get grants, but, uh, but they get zero federal funding and um, donations. Donations are what keep End of Life Washington afloat. If anyone has a little bit to give, End of Life Washington is always happy to receive. Um, <laughs> and, and what's their website? There you go. Here's <laughs> their website. Right, endoflifewashington.org. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but um, no, I I was privileged enough to train. Now, see, uh, death doula is a new. It's a new industry. I don't even want to call it an industry. Yeah, know. You know, Ida Mae Gaskin started the farm, right, for, yes. for birth midwives. Birth. And um, I was privileged enough to birth my second child under a midwife trained by Ida Mae Gaskin. Oh. And it's, you know, and it's lovely and it's wonderful to be close to the root. Right. Jerry Grace Lyons is the Ida Mae Gaskins of death, uh, of death, midwifery yeah and she owns a wonderful practice in sebastopol california and um and by all means if if you are interested in any sort of education or were interested in following that path and learning more or interested in having someone assist you and you are in the california area um, particularly the northern california sebastopol um area please please look her up she's fabulous and she also has a wide connection that she can refer you out to other people that are fabulous that would be um, the case but I was privileged enough to train under her and I would not call myself a death midwife because midwives nowadays are licensed and they are regulated by the government right uh, birth midwives now are, are licensed and regulated by the government and we are not, the death industry has not got into that stage yet right. where there is formal um, licensure. Right. So therefore, I would not consider myself a death midwife, but simply someone that can help you with your path yeah. and walk beside you like a doula. And yeah. so, I did and, uh, labor sorry. coaching uh, so many years ago now and uh other than you know a couple of times at a home birth winding up being the catching the baby uh -huh. um, <laughs> wind but, up being the mitts <laughs> yes, certainly i defer to the midwives you know mm -hmm. um a dear friend of mine um was a midwife and i did more of the labor coaching doula birth photography role um but it's it takes it's a unique individual it calls for that ability to be an advocate to be compassionate to be an energy you know be aware of the energy in the room mm -hmm. um so i i admire what you do so when you act as a death doula you know it's we're all kind of in that making friends with what being around death or facilitating death that journey helping people do that i remember even when i was at a birth doula it was hard for me to ask for money mm -hmm. and to serve uh, because somehow when you receive money for such it feels like spiritual work it feels so heartfelt that uh it was hard to receive money for that and yet you would be there 
you couldn't go anywhere for two weeks prior to a birth or two weeks <laughs> after the baby's late and you never knew when you were going to be called and you spent hours and then if it was in a hospital the doctor runs in at the last minute and he didn't lose a lot of sleep <laughs> but, but as a death doula it's even more open-ended i mean there are certain ways that you can anticipate a death but even in mary's passing there weren't any clues that said that she was going to die the day she did you know she so as a death doula how do you do you have a practice as a death doula now i do have a practice as a death doula um spokanehomefuneral.com <laughs> <laughs> but um you know you're right it's it is a very hard thing to figure out um how you set up, how, yeah. you, how you time your life so you preserve your self-care to be there for people at a moment where time and space collapse, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen some people full circle living and dying out of uh, Grass Valley, California, and uh, Ashley Beeman from A Sacred Passing out of Seattle. She just relocated from Bellingham to Seattle. Um, both of them have had set up practices where they are either sitting vigil prior to death or post death. And then in that, in that sitting witness, they have been able to quantify a value of, for their time. I, and so, and so I think that there are successful ways of, of, of feeding your, of putting food on the table and still, and still, uh, well, as long as it's ramen noodle, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. and, and still, and still providing a sp spiritual work. Um, but, but it is, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, but I think that as more people recognize the need to be filled in their life, and their death, then it will organically make itself into a practice that, mm -hmm. and it may not be my generation that right. that is able to be self-sustaining right. in this practice, but that's okay. Yeah, you know that's if there's people walking the path, then eventually the path will <laughs> work itself out. Because really, it's not not about being able to make money. It's about being able to help people have the choice that they want to have. Yeah. And, you know, as with birth, you can create the most detailed birth plan in the whole world. And then... It all goes out the window. It all goes out the window. And so it it is about planning for everything, but being attached to nothing and open to everything. You know, it's like just organically you have your your ideas in mind and you preserve the the essence mm -hmm. of what the plan was put in place for even if the plan can't unfold in the way mm -hmm. that you had hoped um so I, I know i'm keeping you for quite a while but i one last question i want to ask you is like how how do you interface with the doctors that is um, end of life Washington. That is something that is very organic. End of life Washington is set up so that we have volunteer medical advisors who are generally speaking retired physicians who some of them have retained their license and some have given up their license. And they are the ones that reach out to the, to the different doctors and talk doctor on doctor. And sometimes that works out really well because they, we have some vivacious, um, wonderful orators in our midst. And sometimes we have um, some more cerebral um, people that are very good with the, with the spreadsheets and the quantifying of data. Right. And the, uh, because the other aspect that these medical advisors do is they determine what the best compound of medicine would be to, to hasten someone's death so that they get a, a, a smooth, rapid death right? That's what we all want, right? Once you've made this decision, you don't, you don't want to, don't want to wait around. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so there's, there's 
there's these two things that the medical advisors do that unfortunately are two different personality types, you know, strengths of two different personality types. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they usually interact with the doctors. But as we build doctor, pa doctor relationships with the, with the volunteer client advisors like myself, then we can then reach out and hopefully we have a soft touch and are able to right to get a little a little more positive um interaction with the mds because there's just so much fear there's so much fear over this death with dignity law you know people want to help especially medical people doctors who have walked the path with so many of their patients right. they want to help right but they're not sure what how that help the number one fear of any doctor who's who's contemplating assisting with a death with dignity is how will this affect my license right, right? How will I be able, will someone take away my license and then because I help this one individual, I will not be able to help the next 50,000 individuals that I'll come across with for the rest of my career. Right. 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 And the law has been written to protect the doctors and they are well protected. However, the phobia and the fear mongering is yeah. very prevalent. Right. Very prevalent. And so our medical advisors do a very good job at laying out, um, no, it's okay. Right. It's okay. Look, it's legal. Here it is. Here are the legal documents. You know? so, so they do a good job with that. When people have their own either religious, either their religious beliefs cause questioning for them or they're just uncomfortable talking about death and don't understand it. I mean, what, what have you seen as, what hurdles have you, do you see are there to be cleared in order to help people feel more comfortable with the journey of death, given that we all are going to go through it? Hurdles for the patient, hurdles for the family, hurdles oh. for the both for the medical community which yeah. in Just, which way do you mean um for for those people who may have an inkling that they want they may want that but they're they've got the the overshadowing of their religious beliefs that prevent them and then the questioning of the family you know how how can we help it to be more cohesive for people to explore all of their questions about the death process pick up the phone and call have a volunteer talk to you we we love we love 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 to talk with people about it and i think that's that's the the most reassuring thing you can do for yourself without making any commitment you know Without yeah. saying, hey, I'm at all interested. Just right. say, ah, oh, I'd like to know more about this. Right. You know? right. Um, I think that's, that's how you can help yourself the most. Um, because the, the question I would ask someone with a deep religious base, because I personally have a very deep religious base, a very deep Christian base, um, is does your God want you to suffer right and some people the answer is yes yeah and if that's the case this is not the fit right right it's not it's not you know um absolutely it's not because uh, you should go with your heart your death should be what you want it to be yeah and sometimes that doesn't mean pain free. Yeah. So in serving so many now, you know, as your work expands, mm -hmm. has it, how has it uh, influenced your belief about death? And how has it influenced the choices you want to make for yourself? 
Well, you know, I guess for me, the thing that we have the most work to do as a society is around Alzheimer's and the death with Alzheimer's. Yes, yes, yes. And I think that there, for myself, having my pieces in place so that I can, I can do the death I want to do when I have to do it, when I have to do it, not, (laughs) not any sooner than when I have to do it. (laughs) Where does it stand right now with Alzheimer's? Like if in your advanced directive, I mean, even with with my friend Mary and and her cancer, she had to be cognitively able to make those decisions and to self-ingest. Do you You think not? Okay. So to, to qualify for the death with dignity law in the state of Washington, you have to meet four criteria. You have to be a Washington resident. So that means you must have a residency within the state of Washington. It does not matter a time limit. It does not matter whether it's your primary, secondary, tertiary residency. Right. You and must have a residency. By a driver's license, a lease, a voter, right? You know, your vote. Your, yeah, your voter registration, something that shows that you're a Washington resident. You need to ingest inside the state of Washington also. Yeah. You cannot be a Washington resident, and receive your medication in Washington, and then go to a different state. Yes. The minute you take that medication into a different state, it is no longer legal. Right. So you need to be a Washington resident and ingest inside the state of Washington. You need to be 18 years or older. You need to... Um, have a six month diagnosis, which we've talked about, which means it doesn't mean like a lot of people say, oh, I have cancer, it's a terminal diagnosis. Or I have COPD, that's a terminal diagnosis. Right. Terminal, when they use those words, when they use terminal in that regard, it means it's something you're not going to get better from. Right. right? Um, but that doesn't mean you can't have a very long life from that, the point of that diagnosis. Right. Until, a, you need to have a six month diagnosis to to um, be able to take advantage of the end of uh, the death with dignity law. So that means that two doctors need to say, I guarantee it that within the next six months, you're going to not be right. free. You're not, period. Right. Now, you and I both know. <laughs> You got to be pretty bad off for someone to say that, right? It has to be very close. And I would say that majority of the people who are able to get that diagnosis from people do not have six months. They have probably less than three, sometimes less than two, sometimes sometimes not enough to get through the process itself. Yeah. But they need to have those four things to be able to start the process. Oh. And then that fourth thing, I'm sorry, that was the third. The fourth thing is you must be deemed competent. Mm -hmm. If you have a dementia diagnosis, you are automatically disqualified from using the law because you have not, you are not able to meet that fourth criteria of competency. Do you think there that, uh, do you think at any point in the future, and I can imagine it's a long way out, that given what our Alzheimer's, just the severity of that for so many people, the impact of that for so many people. If, if you write your advanced directive and make it very clear, you know, that at some point further down the road that people will have the option even without the immediate terminal diagnosis. No, I don't think that that will happen. Uh, I really don't because if, if there is De- uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, they have to, that has to be co- that has to coincide with the terminal diagnosis, right? But they would still have to be conscious enough to make their. So you're saying they're disqualified if they have the dementia diagnosis? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they currently are, and I don't see how we can work any magic around that. Yeah. So then the the question becomes. You know, so they won't be able to drink a solution and go gently into gently to sleep and and stop breathing. So then your options become very limited. 
to palliative sedation and, and voluntary stop eating and drinking. And usually you need to start with the voluntary stop eating and drinking to be able to qualify for the palliative sedation. Right. And so then you need to have enough mental competency and um, gumption to, yeah. to, to not eat or drink for, I believe the last I heard that while there's no set policy, the general rule of thumb is most hospices will take you on as a terminal patient after you've stopped for two to three days. Hmm. So that's 72 hours without any consumption. And then they would say, yes, we feel that this person is indeed terminal due to this voluntary stop eating and drinking. And therefore you could get, then get um, drugs on board that would make your make it much more comfortable for you. But um, that's, that's what it would take. So majority of the people with, with Alzheimer's dementia, dementia Alzheimer's will pass that point where they are able to make that sort of, sort of decision themselves before they've really lost the, the spark of living right they, they will they will pass that point where they are capable of doing that for themselves before they're really ready to die right right um and so what we've seen according to our website what what we've seen a positive movement towards for for end of life of people with dementia and alzheimer's is saying in the advanced directive you know well back when they are able to make cognitive decisions um if I resist eating, please do not feed me. Right. If I pull my oxygen mask off, please do not replace it onto my face. Right. If I, and so, um, so these type of decisions written into their advanced care directive could then become more of a legal backing for someone, for their advocate. And then once again, it still takes a very strong advocate to right. be able to assist them, to say, no, this isn't what mom wanted. This isn't what my sister wanted. This isn't what my brother, my husband wanted. Right. We need to stop now. Right. This, is, this is not, you know, we need to stop prolonging their death. Right. 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 Well, I won't keep you any longer. I am so grateful because I think, I mean, I know from my experience with Mary and, and several experiences prior to that, it's just so important to me to uphold the, the right to choose. And yeah. I just want to thank you again for the support that you offered Mary and her partner, Gary, and everyone. It became this, you addressed the needs of everyone uh, in a way that uh, they all felt honored. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful. And if you can tell listeners one more time how they can reach End of Life Washington and how they can reach out to you to either learn more about what it means to be a death doula or how to reach you uh, at that time that they need the services of a death doula. Sure. Thank you. End of Life Washington is endoflifewashington.org. Go on their website and, and you can get the phone number and um, and you can also just enter your information and they can call you back. So whatever at whatever level of technology that you're comfortable with. Um, and then SpokaneHomeFuneral.com is, is mine and you can just call me. I'm 408-768-4655. And so any questions you have, you're welcome to give me a call. Well, thank you so, so very much, Joy. You know, I, I told you long ago that I, when you were assigned as our volunteer, that there were very few things in life that I wanted to do if I couldn't do them with joy and ease. And <laughs> so, so I'm going to have to name my next dog Ease, I think. So. <laughs> joy <and ease. laughs> very good. Well, thank you again. I thank you for it. your time, Rhonda. What a privilege. Thank you very much. In 